I'm, I'm an identical twin, so I tried to build the machine <laughs> learning model that would look at pictures and try to pick the out which one is uh, me and which one is my twin. Um, turns out that's a very hard problem. It could uh, pick out it could pick out other people and family members and identify them, but it had a hard time with my brother and I. But then again, uh, people do too when 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 they see us. So I give myself maybe a B or B minus on that that effort. <laughs>
um, is this a good opportunity to one, learn new things, uh, you know, build bigger and better things and make a bigger mm -hmm. impact in the world? And then two, does it open up more pot doors and possibilities as, as you move on? Because, you know, I didn't know exactly what I wanted, but it would mm -hmm. be nice to have a bunch of different options to choose from and a greater set of options as you progress in your career. So since you have like a really successful career, who is on your personal board of advisors when it comes to career development? You know, it's changed over over time. My wife, I, I rely on quite <laughs> quite a lot. She, you know, she gives <laughs> me uh, great advice um, inside and outside of uh, work. Um, and uh, you know, I've met some people over the years that I do keep in, in touch with. You know, that was one criteria is about where do I want to go next. Is I look at the people I'm working with and I ask, can I learn a lot from these people? And so after I leave and move on to something else, I still have things to learn from them. So I, you know, I do keep in touch with people that I've worked with in the past, and I've been lucky to have some, you know, great mentors like, uh, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos and uh, obviously, and then you know, just people that I've worked with uh, for and with in the different um, in in different roles. I still keep in touch with them. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm curious, like, so you mentioned that like you found out about Amazon when they were like a small startup, right? Um, and then I feel like quitting your own startup to join another startup, it takes a lot of courage. And uh, what do you see in the company back then that you feel like this was a good idea to join? Yeah, there were, I mean, there, there were, there was not a bad choice at that point in time. Our company mm -hmm. was growing quickly and it, it was a different type of, of company. And, uh, you know, it was just a lot of the energy that um, we, we noticed at Amazon that there was mm -hmm. something special going on that could be um, really, really big. There was a lot of risk involved too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't, no one knew Amazon would turn into to what it is to, uh, today. There, you know, a lot of the companies at that time are no longer around. And, you know, that mm -hmm. could very well have happened to Amazon at that time. You know, people look at Amazon now and say, well, it's always been, uh, you know, very successful, but there were ups and downs and in, in roller coaster rides uh, in, mm -hmm. in the early days. But it was really um, the, and then looking at the customer feedback that customers really just loved what <clears throat> we were building at, at Amazon. So um, that was, you know, and one thing that just really drew me to that. Um, is that, you know, and it was a, a, one of the first B2C uh, endeavors I was in too. So I wanted to, you know, had been doing B2B mm -hmm. up to this point and figured, well, may as well learn this, this part of the world too. And mm -hmm. it, what a better place to learn where customers are already validating with their feedback in their, you know, their wallet that this is a great service, even though it was only books at the time. Curious, like, um, what is one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at? It could be technical skill like coding or like soft skill like sales. I mean, I always love learning new things. And, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, when machine learning, everyone was talking about that, I read some articles and, and I, I'm, I'm an identical twin. So I tried to build mm -hmm. the machine learning model that would look at pictures and try to pick the out uh, which one is uh, me and which one is my twin. Um, turns out that's a very hard problem. It could uh, pick out, it could pick out other people and family members and identify them, but it had a hard time with my brother and I, but then again, uh, people do too when, when, when they see us. So, uh, it, it's, um, I give myself maybe a B or B minus on that, that effort. But so that's just an example of, you know, as if something, I realize something is very important and can change the world. I do want mm -hmm. to get into the details to understand at a fundamental level, what it is, because then you can also have a large vision and figure out how you can use some of these uh, technologies or uh, movements to, you know, to, to, you know, to, to make a, a pretty special things in the future. I do see what you're saying about like, you know, learning new things, constantly curious about like what's going on is a skill that's, uh, and then like you are technically leveraging your curiosity to keep learning and then gaining new skills. Since like, there are so many smart people working at Amazon and then being Jeff's TA, like, you know, uh, the first person now is like the Amazon CEO and like you're, you are the second TA. This is like a really competitive position. I guess like, what is your unfair advantage? AKA like, what is your like superpower? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, what, what if I have a, a superpower, but I, you know, one of the things is I look at a situation and I, I try to figure out a way to say yes, or, or try to figure out a way how to make it happen versus mm -hmm. look at reasons why it, it it's impossible or I can't do it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I'm an engineer by training, but I had, you know, I had a story to tell with this book and mm -hmm. 
So I thought, why not try writing a book? It, you know, if it doesn't work, I'll know that I'm not an author. That's not my calling. Um, and so it was hard. I learned a lot. It was very humbling. You know, made um, some mistakes along the way. Had a lot of people who helped me through that process. Um, and you know, Bill and I through that process, my co-author. But I think just looking at a situation and figuring out how you how you can accomplish something, you know, by default, and not worry about what anyone else. Um, uh, if they say you can't do it or, uh, you know, and not worrying about the naysayers, you know, you have to prove to yourself whether it's it's uh, achievable or not. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they're right and you, you actually can't do something. But, you know, I, I like to find out on my own if that's possible. So you eventually worked with Jeff Bezos closely for two years as his TA. What do you think sets him apart with like other leaders that you've previously worked with, for example, like Orco's CEO or like other company that you've encountered later on? Yeah. Well, so first of all, I never met or worked with Larry Ellis. <laughs> I started off in, at Oracle, so you can't really comment on, on that. But, um, you know, I think that uh, what really is special about Jeff Bezos is you know, he, the, from the first day I, I met him, uh, you know, it was back in 1998, he said he wanted to build Earth's most customer centric company and then mm -hmm. build the place where people can find and discover anything you, you might want to buy online. I didn't really understand what Earth's most customer centric <laughs> company meant at that time. I heard that and I'm like, yeah, you know, but, um, you know, I think Jeff, in terms of customer obsession, long term thinking, the ability to look at something with a longer term time horizon than most, you'll make different mm -hmm. decisions that way. And uh, just his spirit of invention, you combine those three things. And then the last thing is getting the little details right. Um, mm -hmm. That is a super powerful combination. You know, some leaders I've met have one or two of those. Jeff has all four and they're really um, Im embedded in who he is. And he then embedded that into how Amazon operates. And so I, you know, and that was something that you don't really notice from the outside in looking at Amazon, mm -hmm. but you know, those things about customer obsession, which is completely different than customer focus, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and uh, long-term thinking and mention, and then operational excellence or getting those details right, that mm -hmm. the details matter um, is, is fairly unique, I've found, especially after working now with lots of different uh, companies. And, and I realize how powerful that can be to build uh, a lasting, um, organization or endeavor that's you know worthy to tell your grandkids about okay so i'm i have one question about the customer centric so this morning i was chatting with another like um c-level executive at another company and then basically they were mentioning they are employee focused they're mentioning treating employee right um that will lead to the employee treating the customer right um like i think since like it's probably different company have different business models so like as a tech company um it's like it, it is like your product is what you're presented to the customer, but like some other company, like service based company, like hotel or something, it could be, uh, you know, employee are directly interact with your customer. I'm just curious, like you mentioned about like being customer focused and being customer centric are different. What are the differences? Well, I mean. Customer obsessed means that you're what well, you're not going to compromise, and so mm -hmm. you're not going to you and and you start from the perspective of the customer, and then that perspective kind of dictates to you where you need to go and where you need to change as a company or what what you need to build. You know, it's it's which is different than we have a product or something we're trying to shoehorn and how can we uh, focus on the customer to make sure they buy that? Or how can we do something that makes the customer just click more times on, on using our product? That may or may not be what the customer wants. You know, so for at Amazon, uh, it's not, the problem wasn't how do you get people to stay on Amazon as long as possible? It's mm -hmm. how do you help them make informed purchase decisions? Sometimes that means you tell them you they know right away and they're in and out and then they get the product mm -hmm. an hour or two later. And, it, you know, so it, and that's when you focus on the customer, they'll um, take you down a path that you, you know, may be surprised where it mm -hmm. eventually leads. So that's the difference, I think, between being customer obsessed and, uh, you know, customer focused. So after you've worked with Jeff Bezos as his TA, um, you've went on to lead IMDB um, so with Amazon. So curious, like what were some lessons that you took from working with Jeff Bezos to when you're running your own department? 
Well, so I, but I was the chief operating officer at IMDb. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl Needham was the founder of IMDb, the CEO. He was and is, is still there. So he was mm-hmm. the, the CEO of IMDb, just to mm-hmm. be, be clear about that. Um, but when I joined IMDb, I thought it was a, a really special um, organization. It was uh, it started off all virtual, by the way, which um, now mm-hmm. in the past two years seems uh, pretty normal. But, uh, you know, it started in the 90s. And uh, mm-hmm. I don't think there was ever a time where the whole company was ever in one room because they were distributed literally around the world, uh, mm-hmm. you know, fairly quickly, even when they had just a handful of people volunteering on the project. So um, it was interesting to see what a virtual company looked like that started that way and how they built different processes to handle that not everyone's in, in the same room. You know, some of these things now we take for granted after two years with Zoom calls and, and collaboration, mm-hmm. but having to build that with without those tools, you know, 20 years ago was, was uh, something special. But it was also new, you know, it's it's an advertising-based business, you know, collecting lots mm-hmm. of da- data about movies and TV shows and everyone involved in the industry. Then there was a subscription-based business, IMDb mm-hmm. Pro, which anyone who's in the industry, a movie industry or TV industry has a subscription to that. Um, so it was a chance to learn new things. And the team was was fantastic too. So it had all of those elements about it had a large audience. We could make a big difference with, with and improve customers' lives, both from people who are curious about movies and mm-hmm. TV shows, also helping people find the right jobs in the mm-hmm. entertainment industry, learning new things. And it was a fantastic team to work for. So it was, it was mm-hmm. a fun five years. Yeah, for sure. So um, in your book, there were like a lot of really great ideas. Like one is like the bar raiser process. So like basically you guys will have a team of people who just primarily focus on interviewing other people. So from what I remember, it's like they also have like a real job and then they would do that on the side, right? They're not going to be in the team of like the team that are hiring. I think that's like super interesting. So if you're a bar raiser, like what are some things that you should be examining? Like I know that you're supposed to see if that person have like one specific strength that's like overpowering everybody else when it comes to like executing on something like this how do you apply that into like a small team well you know so a bar raiser it's the name of the amazon hiring program it was one Mm -hmm. of the first scalable processes that amazon Mm -hmm. created and it's also a specific role in that process so the the role of the bar raiser is to just ensure that the person who gets hired makes the company better, you know, it raises the bar at, at the company. Um, mm-hmm. The bar raiser, it, it doesn't report into the hiring manager. So that is a unique thing about it. So that they don't have that urgency bias on if we don't hire three people by the end of the month, we're not going to get the work done. So the bar raiser has an objective view and their, their role is essentially to coach the interviewing panel on how to be better mm-hmm. interviewers. So it's, it's a scalable process, but it also has a great feedback loop. The more you do it, mm-hmm. the better everyone gets at interviewing. And, you know, in, in a fast growing company, um, <clears throat> you're, you're, you will not succeed unless you keep hiring uh, people and, you know, not just bar raisers, but uh, hiring managers. So, um, you know, spend at Amazon while I was there, you know, we, we would spend about a day a week focused on mm-hmm. Uh, hiring, um, recruiting people, trying to sell people, interviewing, looking at debrief feedback. And because as a leader, um, your your job is to, uh, you know, grow the team and and, and then develop uh, the leaders of, of tomorrow. So it wasn't really a, a separate job. It was, mm-hmm. you realize that as, as, to be an effective leader, this is one of the things that we had to do. You had to build mm-hmm. products, you had to hire people, you had to be a good operator, you had to develop your team, you had to do all of those in order to be successful. Um, so the you know, Bar Razor started in 1999 at Amazon, mm-hmm. and it was when we realized that th- we had some great interviewers, and we wanted to take what was in their head and made them special interviewers and kind of encode that into a process so we could scale and be repeatable across all of the different groups. So you didn't have to keep relying on the same set of people to vet talent. So in a small um, you know, organization, try to figure out how you can make it a data-driven, 
um, teachable, trainable process. That way, then you can and scale and grow quickly. You know, thankfully, learning how to be a good interviewer is a teachable skill. You can't tell, teach someone how to be smarter or be taller, um, but you can teach them how to be, you know, here's some techniques to uh, be a great interviewer. And so um, we realized that pretty early on. And I think that was one of the things, even to this day, is really a, a competitive advantage for Amazon. When I was listening to this part, one thing I was thinking of is as a startup or like working as like a one person team as a solopreneur who manages like, you know, freelancers on Upwork or something. First of all, like you don't really have that many candidates. I know like, you know, for Amazon, it's like one of the top company in the world. There's like, you know, a billion people at like trying to get into one like job. So curious as a startup founder, how do you implement this into your recruiting process? Also, the other part is, so I believe like in the end of the book, you guys were mentioning, you guys hired an executive who is super senior uh, in Palo Alto, um, trying to start a different division. So essentially, this person was already like, have like a lot of great like track record before and then they work at top companies before when you guys were hiring someone like this how do you make sure that they could manage to like adapt into the amazon culture quickly great question so first of all it is still hard it was always hard when i was there at amazon to find great talent especially for technical roles software engineers data scientists great product managers so it it's not like people were all jumping in the boat. You had to go. You had, it was you had to go find them and convince them to work at at Amazon. So, but really, what the the bar raiser process is all about is you have your and it is about mapping a candidate's past behavior to the mm -hmm. Amazon leadership principles. And so, mm -hmm. in your own organization, you know you'll have your own leadership principles or core values. Those things are interchangeable terms. Mm -hmm. um, and that what that is, that's really defines who you are as a company, how you make decisions and what makes you unique and special. And so mm -hmm. you want it, first of all, you want to have that written down and everyone understands that both the candidate, because they'll look at that and they'll say, yeah, this is a great place for me or no, this isn't my mm -hmm. cup of tea. I'll, I'll go look somewhere else. But also, so all of the interviewers then know we're going to look for candidates who have done or exhibited these characteristics in their past career. So that's a mm -hmm. huge, you know, I'm setting aside technical assessments, which is an important part of the interview process. But the, a large part of it is has, does, has this candidate embodied the Amazon leadership principles in their past mm -hmm. uh, career, um, you know, or mm -hmm. if it's their college hires in, 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 in school. Um, so mm -hmm. with, to answer your second question about what do you do with senior leaders, well, it is no different. Um, and and the, the risks are higher also if you miss um, and you make you you bring someone on who tries to change the culture and their culture typically would be what their last organization was or you know how what mm -hmm. they built over their long course of their career. And we did have a few cases where we brought in a senior executive who wasn't really Amazonian and tried mm -hmm. to change that culture. And changing culture is really hard. It usually doesn't work. And uh, especially if the rest of the the um, organization has a very strong culture and and, mm -hmm. and you know so those people tended not to last very long. So we um, experience and expertise is great, but it's a, a deal breaker if we don't think that you can embody the Amazon leadership principles. And especially mm -hmm. if you're going to go start a new office somewhere in a new location, because what you don't want to do is have these pockets of different cultures um, in different geographies. And so we we had a bunch of processes to make sure when we moved into a new geography, you know, after it got started up, it would look, just look like an Amazon uh, you know, company, you walk into a meeting, a weekly business review or what, what have you, mm -hmm. and you'd know, okay, this is an Amazon uh, way of doing things. Yeah, for sure. So when it comes to execution, so this bar razor is a team, right? And then like, there's also, I assume this candidate have to also go through like, like a technical interview or some other interviews to prove that they are qualified for this. So is a bar razor coming later? Or do you feel like it should come in first? Well, th th there's an interviewing panel. And even the technical uh, interviews Mm -hmm. typically do have some culture questions, but it, they uh, assess also, does this candidate map, mm -hmm. does their behavior map to the leadership principles? So, you know, you enter, there's a panel of five to seven people that happens after the phone screen, when you, 
you decide to bring it the panel that typically happens all at once you know but beforehand it would happen in a day on site but now it you know it could happen virtually over uh, you know a short period of time but then the whole interview panel gets together and um, looks at the written feedback and this is the first time they see the written feedback too so you don't want to have bias about when i'm writing my opinion i don't want to know and i can't know what the other interviewers thought i have to make my own independent assessment write it down thoroughly and then mm -hmm. that's going to be i know that my peers are going to read that so i want to make sure i do a good job mm -hmm. at that so um you look at both aspects you look at how does this candidate map to the leadership principles mm -hmm. and also how did they do on um, the various technical assessments but you have to do both because of Amazon has set the bar really high at the beginning because I guess like you and your co-author were like in the team really early on um, to set up this great like principle and culture you guys observe and then like experience the early days when a lot of these principle was adapted or like started like shaping into places. I feel like nowadays because of people in my generation, like the millennial slash Gen Z people, like everyone's like leaving all the time. And then like the company switch from, you know, uh, future of work to like web three within a day. So like, how do you kind of create these kind of principles in today's environment because of everything is changing and the people are in this really fast, like status driven culture space? I can take a crack at it. <laughs> you know, it, it is uh, uh, yet to be a uh, completely solved problem. But uh, one way to, to approach it is to really focus and codify and write down who are you as an organization? What, you know, what makes us special? And, um, and then look for people when they, who come in, they're going to, the one they'll like it there, but they're gonna reinforce the culture and mm -hmm. you know, the, so the company stays true to its roots. Sometimes people leave, especially when they join a young company, and then um, a year later they leave. They leave because the company is different, and mm -hmm. the the companies. And we have seen this a number of times. And and there are two two main causes that cause the company to be different from you know let's say year one to year two. One is that they didn't really define you know, and 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 know who who they were. So they didn't have that course. Uh, Mm -hmm. core values or leadership principles to say, how do we make tough decisions? Um, you know, how do we interact with one another? And th again, those are different for each company. So that's one thing. And so mm -hmm. when they brought people on, the, you know, they didn't know what the culture was. So you had this mishmash and you will get a culture a year later. It just, you want it to be the one that you want, not, mm -hmm. not what it evolves into. And then, and then the, or the second reason why it's different in year two versus year one is you don't have a deliberate hiring process to say, mm -hmm. we need this next person to um, reinforce the culture. If you don't do that, especially when you're going from five people to 20 people, well, you've got 15 people who are changing that culture and the 15 will win out over the five and it'll become the, the whatever culture those 15 people brought from wh wherever they came. So mm -hmm. people will leave the company because it's, it is a different company. And mm -hmm. so I think what Amazon recognized pretty early on is they had a strong set of core values, you know, around customer obsession, invention, long-term thinking, mm -hmm. and uh, operational excellence, and really looked for people who wanted to do that. And mm -hmm. uh, not everyone does. And and so, but Amazon has stayed nimble and, 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 and true to its roots because they continually seek out people where that's a fit for them. And so you mm -hmm. can do that, you know, whether you're a millennial or whether you've been working at uh, someplace for, you know, uh, five, 10, 20 years, uh, mm -hmm. as long as you define who you are and you figure out that this person is a good culture fit, chances are that they'll stay around longer. And, you know, you look at the, the distribution of how long people stay, uh, companies with strong cultures, there's typically a little bimodal distribution. So you'll see mm -hmm. two, two humps. It's not like a bell curve. Um, some people get in right away and they, they quickly realize, hey, this isn't a place for me. Um, but then the rest tend to stay for a very long time. That second hump is, is further on down the road. Amazon is super frugal, right? Like I remember they told me about like they're ordering like a company furniture or something. And then their boss asked them to return this because it's like so expensive or whatever. So the TLDR is like, and then you guys don't, I believe there was no free food at the point when like, I don't know, in Silicon Valley, you know, when you go to Facebook, Google uh, on the campus, there's like five restaurants and stuff like that. So um, Amazon is definitely not famous for, you know, being super um, lavish on like entertainment related things. So curious, what 
do you think about Amazon would keep the talents? And also another thing about at the beginning of the book, I believe when it comes to hiring, you guys are aligned with the salary. So like a lot of it were like stock or something like that. So basically you guys were very aligned with people on the long-term game. Um, so one thing is I feel like nowadays people stop thinking super long-term, especially like people in my generation are like, so uh, like, like solopreneur, because everyone's like, I'm going to start my own business one day. Like, this is like, like within this narcissistic culture, basically. Um, so curious, um, how do you set the incentive for someone to stay from like this generation? It gets back to really defining who you are. Cause you know, there are Google and Facebook offices with free lunches and masseuses <laughs> and ice cream right across the street from a lot of Amazon buildings across the country or probably even the world. But at Amazon, what we were focusing on was make it a place where builders can build so they can build things at a large scale that make a material difference for tens, hundreds of millions or you know, billion people or, or, or more in that you have all, all of that data. And all that the process around it and being customer obsessed in terms of uh, going to to build those things, that's just who we were. And you know, and part of being customer obsessed, if you're a retailer, is having low prices. And mm -hmm. you can't have low prices if you have a big cost structure. And so, mm -hmm. being frugal was something that we had to do. And you can't just say, "Well, be frugal only in this situation, but not when you have free lunch." Or like because we have free food, or because we I really want a masseuse, or this you know uh, for office furniture looks really cool, and uh, and so that frugality, it's just it was embedded into the DNA. It's a leadership principle of Amazon, and you know some people are okay with that. They're willing to trade off a free lunch to get to work with large data sets to make impacts on hundreds of millions of customers to um, be innovative and uh, get a chance to innovate and build brand new things that may not have anything to do with retail. It may be something crazy like cloud computing or drones or running an airline fleet. But, um, but you know, that, so that is how you, you define who you are and you stick um, true to your values. And it's not for everyone. There's some people who want to go across the street and they want a different culture and there are different company cultures, and that's totally fine. Um, you know, thankfully, there are lots of different ways to build great companies. But I think where you get into trouble is if you don't know what your culture is, or you choose it's an a la carte version of your culture, then you don't really have one. It's just a mishmash of, of things. And that's when people realize that, you know, it's not consistent and it's mm -hmm. not for them. As far as the, the millennials... Um, you know, well, I'm not an expert on, on that, <laughs> but I, you know, I do think that people and even millennials that I work with, you know, the time horizon, their long-term thinking in, in a lot of aspects of their lives in terms of what is the environment going to look like, you know, in terms of like, what's the world going to look like, you <laughs> mm -hmm. know, 20 years from now. And so those types of things you can um, you know, uh, attract millennials to, to work on something that's a laudable goal that makes a meaningful different difference in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are ways to, you know, to, to get around that, that problem. The other huge uh, part of Amazon from like, when I was listening to it, it was Amazon was really great at like picking what product to build and then like doubling down on it. And like you guys talked about like how, like the launch of Amazon Prime, uh, the launch of like free delivery, Kindle, and like, and there were also like product that didn't really make the cut, right? So how do you pick what is like a core product the company should build first? Because you guys, you and your co-author see, have seen how Amazon started as like an online bookstore, right? So from an online bookstore, that one product, um, how do you guys like branch out to the second, third, fourth product? And how do you like stay focused? Because especially when the company is huge, like it's super easy to lose track because the customer wants everything, right? So like, it's hard to pick which one to start. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great question. And one way to answer it is to slightly rephrase the question is that we don't really choose what product to build next. The first thing we do is we define what is the customer problem we want to try to solve. Mm -hmm. We may not even have the solution in mind at this point yet. Mm -hmm. And so, so we don't pick the product, we pick the, the problem. 
and and we the, we do this through uh, we uh, you know Amazon does this through the working backwards process, which is how you vet new ideas. The first thing you have to do is you have to define who your customer is. It sounds easy, but it's harder than you may think. The you know, the second thing is you have to say what is the customer problem we're trying to solve, mm -hmm. and then uh, third is what is our solution, and then you say. And can we convince the customers to actually go use this or buy this? You have to make a convincing case to yourself and then eventually others. And then the last one you have to ask is, is it big enough um, to be worth doing? And so, and you, we do this through a press release. And then an FAQ document is where you ask and answer all of the hard questions in order to, to really address those five issues. And you don't move on until you, you've convinced yourself of those things. So this is, I think, one um, key reason why Amazon has gotten into so many different lines of, of business and uh, is that uh, we've, we identify hard problems that are um, real problems for customers and then go figure out, it, can we solve them? And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, and, and then you have to ask, you know, do we have the resources or the capability to go do that? In some mm -hmm. cases we didn't, you don't, and you don't always have to be convinced that you can solve the problem, you know, because mm -hmm. some problems are hard, but if you do mm -hmm. um, solve it, it's, it's worthy and it will make a big difference in their life. So, you know, by design, some of these uh, ideas that get greenlit are going to fail. And Amazon does have you know, a long line of of failures along with some pretty big successes. Mm -hmm. The thing about this is if you choose big uh, total addressable markets and meaningful customer problems, all you need is a few hits to pay for all of those other failures. You know, mm -hmm. web services, uh, AWS, big hit. It pays for a, a lot of, pays the bills for a lot of uh, mm -hmm. experimentation and failures. And, you know, it, experimentation, you can't say it's an experiment. You know, Jeff is uh, famous for saying, if you know it's going to work beforehand. Mm -hmm. So if all of your experiments, quote unquote, work, they're, they're probably not experiments and you're probably not pushing the boundary enough. Okay, so let's do like a example exercise, right? So for example, right now I run my own media company. So what my first product is this podcast. My second product is YouTube and third product is like newsletter. And then right now the crypto web three thing is happening. So right now I want to pivot my, like I want to like launch a different product, for example, a different podcast or like a live session or something around web three. What should I write on my press release? And what's like, how should I QR, F, F, Q, like PR FAQ myself as like a solopreneur? Bill and I did this for our book. That was one of the, mm -hmm. fir the first things we did is we wrote a PR FAQ document. One is you just have to find who, you know, who, who is this product for? Who's my customer? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and really who is it for? It's not what the total addressable market. It's not anyone who listens to podcasts or, you know, it's, it's some, you have to get very precise on who actually is my customer for what I'm trying to build? And then two, what is the, you know, what app, what problem am I trying to solve for customers? Mm -hmm. Do people, is this a real problem? Some people have a kind of a cool product in mind, but it doesn't solve a real world customer problem. So they're probably not going to buy it and it's probably not going to get adopted or use it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, who's the customer? What's the, the problem? And then figure out, is this thing that I'm building or thinking of doing, is that the best way to solve this problem that I know how to do? And so those would be, you know, the three places to, to start. And then if I did do this, you think people would adopt it. You have to be brutally honest with yourself and, you know, show it to other people and collect feedback. And, you know, sometimes you'll get feedback, great idea, but it's, you know, but here, here are three other things you need to go solve. It's an iterative process. You do that. And then is it big enough? You could do those for answer those for first four questions, but it the number of customers or the you know the 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 amount of money they'd be willing to invest or time to to go do it may be so small that it's not worth doing. And by the way, that that last one is yeah. what when uh, why most ideas don't make it through this process at Amazon. It's a good idea. It's a good solution. You know, you could solve it. Um, but you know the effort and 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 then the total addressable market is uh, it's probably not big enough to be worth doing. I have a quick question about this. So basically, you and your co-author are the OG people at Amazon team, and then you also work with the executive Jeff Bezos closely, right? Like you are the right person to solve this problem. So number one is like, how do you identify if you are the person to solve the problem if it's not? extremely obvious as you know web3 everyone can be an expert in web3 since it's so new and then number two is when you guys think of the solution let's say if you guys decided to write a book right like that cost basically you 
only your time as the dollar amount, right? So instead of like, you know, you're building uh, the next Amazon or something like you, you build another app, that's like a, a lot of costs, right? Like, so number one is like, how do you identify you're the person to build this thing? And then number two is um, how do you do the budget planning or like, how do you think it's like, this is a realistic problem that we solve it? You know, to identify as the right person or are we the right team do we, you know, to, to build this thing, um, you just have to figure out, well, what is it going to take to actually build this product or service or what, you know, what, what you're trying to do and, you know, what are the core competencies and even, it's okay if you don't have them at the, that period of time where you're, you're going through this process, but you have to say, can we, I realistically achieve them or hire a team mm-hmm. to go do, do something like this. And, you know, if, if the answer is the form of, yeah, I want to be the Apple of X or the Google of Y, <laughs> well, Apple's probably going to be the Apple of X. They just haven't got around to it yet. Um, and, you know, so you have to just realize if we get the resources, you know, if it, especially if it's a small organization, if we get the capital or like, can we actually build what we, what we say at, at the quality that, that that's needed in order to do it. So um, gathering that data up front and getting soliciting opinions on, Hey, you know, is, is, this is a great idea. Um, but I'm not sure if we could build it because here are the three things that could make this fail. Um, and so you want to study those three things up front. That's a case where slowing down and at that point in the process, actually, if you can achieve that, it gets you to the end of the, the, the process faster. So that's one of the, the fallacies about that I often hear about long-term thinking is that you know, you're just moving slow. Well, there in certain parts of the process, if you slow down and get your direction right, you'll mm-hmm. get to where you're going faster. And that's the difference between speed and velocity. You know, speed is just 50 miles an hour. Um, velocity is 50 miles an hour in a certain direction. And so mm-hmm. people who are just focused on speed often are zigging and zagging, and it will take them longer to get to where they want to go. When you compare someone who gets the direction set first and then you know marches you know 50 miles an hour in that direction like i think it's super right that when you set you know figure out what's the core competency before you get on and then like evaluate if you can actually do this or not i was just thinking about like if i were like the cfo of amazon like how am i going to look at the spreadsheet of like the projection of a particular product and then there are so many products so when it comes to convincing a team to both a certain things. So when I was listening to the book, a lot of it was just like top down. It's like Jeff Bezos is instinctly telling people we're going to go for, you know, free delivery. And then this is going to happen by the end of the year or something like that. Right. Um, so when this kind of things happen, I guess like how many products are because of like the leader have some sort of insight and then just decided to go build it. And then how many of like the product was like people have to convince their leader and their leader's leader to build something. The latter didn't really happen because you're not trying to convince people at mm-hmm. Amazon that you, this is worthy of building. And, and it, it's a different mindset. It's it, There's a truth-seeking mindset at Amazon mm-hmm. where when you write the PRFAQ, you're trying to uncover whether this is a good idea. You're trying to get other people in your group, your manager, the, you know, the S team, which is Jeff Bezos's direct reports or Andy Jassy's direct reports, to help shape that idea. And, you know, so I think that is one difference that I've seen at Amazon versus other companies. Because even if it's your idea, the, the, mm-hmm. like if you're in a room with a bunch of executives, um, I tend to want to get their opinion and validate, like say, hey, can you help make this better? And then mm-hmm. at some point you want to say, okay, we now we want to make a green light decision to go uh, pay for it. But but there's this whole set of truth seeking that needs to happen first through the PRFAQ process. And that's a bunch of iterations. And there are senior leaders who review that. So it's not where, so I'm, if I have an idea, it's not that I'm trying to go sell that at first. It's I'm trying to go solicit the right expertise around the company to, to help to have them get input to make this thing better, this, you know, this idea mm-hmm. or this proposal better. And at that point, once it's ready, then you can get it to be greenlit. So um, I think that's one difference. You know, you don't try to sell right away before it goes outside of your group. But you, the first thing mm-hmm. you do is you just cast it wide as possible to get a lot of feedback to make it better. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some some ideas that came, you know, top down. Like Jeff Bezos decided we want to go do Amazon Prime and we're going to do it in three months. And 
but uh, there are a lot of ideas that came from uh, other areas of the company. And the idea is um, just, it is a, it's an important part, but it's by no means the whole part. You, mm -hmm. you know, executing on that idea, refining the idea, you know, and defining it, so what it is and what it is not, hiring and staffing a team and acquiring mm -hmm. the expertise to go build it. There's a lot of heavy lifting that ha happens after, oh, I have an idea. Like Jeff Bezos didn't say, we're going to go invent cloud computing, and then it just happened. Um, you know, there, there was, and, and by the way, it, it, AWS wasn't really one thing at the time. It was a bunch of series of different web services, some of so, which never saw the light of day that we tried. And then a few like S3 and EC2 were huge uh, successes. But we did not know at the time when we started on that first set of you know, five to eight web services, which ones of the two, you know, like one or two would be massive successes. Um, so it, it worked a little bit different than uh, there were a few mandates like we are going to go do this, but by and large that the Amazon innovation process and the invention process is designed where people get involved in it in vet ideas uh, cheaply and through the working backwards process and start to work on uh, meaningful customer problems that you know come out as a result of the working backwards process. So I have some curiosity about like when you guys write this book, I feel like it's super thorough and like it's like really solution driven to just like I'm just like so impressed by like how you guys like remembering things as well as like putting it in like such a great structure. So I want to learn more about like some of your personal experiences from like working there. Right. So what were some, I guess, like challenges you were facing like personally at the beginning when you started like implementing some of these like principles. I'm also curious, like what would be like one core principle to implement at the very, very beginning? I know that you guys mentioned a little bit at the end of the book, but I just wanted to know because there's no way I can implement 14 principle in one day. And then I don't, yeah, like when I read the principle eight, I already re not remember principle six. So yeah. Um, well, first, Amazon now has 16. So in the past couple of months, oh, God. Two, so now it's 16. I think there's 750 words on, on if you're, uh, around that order, number of words in the leadership uh, pr principles. But, you know, we don't, we actually don't encourage an organization to just copy Amazon's leadership principles and start from there. So mm -hmm. if I were to give uh, uh, advice, especially for uh, a smaller or a newer organization, it's to really come up with your own set of what makes you unique um, and how you make decisions and how you're going to encounter what sets of principles and values you'll fall, you'll fall back on in order to solve these uh, you know, yet unknown problems that you know you're going to face. You don't know what they are, but you know you're going to face them. So what toolkit do you want to give um, yourself, but also all of the employees in the company <laughs> to, to, you know, to, to rely on in order to, to, to face these situations? So just defining that uh, really, really helps and because that enables um, consistent de decision making, you know, and you don't have to be in the room as the founder for all of those types of decisions. You have to make sure that um, but then the second part is once you get those processes, those leadership um, values or, you know, uh, principles defined, then you need to weave those into the way you do business. So, you know, like the working backwards is a great example of weaving customer obsession into how you that new ideas and decide whether to build a, a product is that you can't cannot pass go unless you define who your customer is. And like we talked about in the problem you're trying to solve. Um, so there's no way you could actually you go through the working backwards process without being customer obsessed, without having long term thinking or you know, getting the, the details right, diving deep to get the details right. That is um, the very first piece of advice I would say, because your culture is going to cement cr pretty quickly in, in your organization. So you may as well shape the mode yourself rather than have it be shaped for you. If you're leading one part of the Amazon team today, which department would you want to lead? Oh, I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, it's scale of Amazon is mind boggling. So there'd be so many to choose from. I probably would choose an area where, uh, you know, fall back on some of the criteria I'd use to figure out what to do next. I would look at, <clears throat> am I going to learn a lot from the, from the team, the, the leaders in the team, from the person I'm working for? Um, <clears throat> is it going to make a big difference in people's lives better in a, a meaningful way and in a meaningful number? And, uh, and if I could learn something new. And so if, if those are the criteria, 
there are a lot of things that would fit there. It wouldn't matter to me really what um, vertical the business is. And that's just how, how you know, my own decision-making criteria and everyone has their own unique ones. So there's not one that's better than another. <laughs> but I think going into, uh, if, I, if I were to do that, I would first of all, write that stuff down to say, here's the criteria I'm going to use. And then I'd figure out what the list is and see what the best mapping was. But I you know, don't know exactly which one. <laughs> um, so after Amazon, you work at Redmart. It's like a Singapore company. How was implementing the Amazon principles overseas? Like what, like what was that experience look like? I found that a lot of the processes were universal. You know, again, I didn't take the four, at that time there were 14, the 14 leadership principles in the Redmart and say, we now have Redmart 14 leadership principles, you know, help, help shape and define that culture. A lot of it was already uh, well-defined and it was some, it was similar to Amazon's, but at, at Redmart and then working in Southeast Asia, there were some differences in terms of the market, but those were more, uh, you know, like payments, uh, delivery, quite, quite different. Um, but in terms of how you can build a great uh, company and operate, those things were transportable over uh, borders. Uh, and so I like any of the Amazon processes about being customer obsessed, looking at details, um, you know, diving deep into details, thinking long term, those things uh, could port over uh, pretty easily there. So it was managing fulfillment centers too. And, you know, safety was a big thing that one minor difference that we had to overcome was. Uh, deference to your uh, supervisor or someone you know who's, who's managing you, especially when you see something that's unsafe, um, you just need to say, well, no, safety trumps everything else. So you know, focus on addressing that safety issue, even if um, you know it, it, your manager is the one who's causing that. You know that that is, is okay, and, and that we we expect people to do that. Um, that actually was a, a fairly quick change to implement too. But um, by and large, uh, we found that these processes and practices uh, really advances in management science that um, mm -hmm. we write about in the book and that now that we've been working with it in, in other companies um, are applicable to small organizations, large organizations, B2B, B2C, mm -hmm. all digital, physical products, food, um, and, and across geographies. So, you know, thankfully that this is, it's very portable across all those different dimensions that I mentioned. Yeah. So before we do like the one minute fire round, so I have like one last, last question for you. Yeah. So I would love to, for you to like promote your own business. Like I, I know that you are coaching like a lot of startups and then different companies. Like, can you tell us more about like, you know, what's the future for your own company? Yeah. So I mean, first of all, Bill and I wrote the book just to get this mm -hmm. uh, information out in the public dialogue about mm -hmm. what is some of the secret sauce that made Amazon special, because we had not seen that the answer to the question, how does Amazon work, um, answered uh, comprehensively and uh, in, with enough detail where it was actionable uh, for people to read the book and then go mm -hmm. do something with it. So that was our goal. We, we wrote that book and once it got out there, people started to contact us to say, hey, can you help us um, implement some of these things? So Bill and I, we put the company together to go mm -hmm. help companies who want to learn more about these principles and practices and go implement in their in their company. And really the, the sweet spot we've found are, you know, like series C, D companies that already have um, you know, a, a product that works that customers like, and they're trying to double, triple, 10x in size, want to know how to do that on, up through public companies too, that want to adopt some of these, um, you know, advances in management science that Amazon has developed either in terms of how do I look at input metrics to, um, you know, to drive my business in addition to just um, focusing on output metrics, mm -hmm. operating cadence, that was another big surprise, um, you know, how do I operate my company now? It's different than when it was a uh, you know a ten person company. Now, what does the staff meeting look like? What does a weekly business review look like? What does annual planning look like? How can you make sure that we're getting all the resources aligned to build the right things? So we help companies walk through those and uh, uh, introduce and and uh, deploy those types of processes 
um, and, and uh, it's some of them are most of them are lightweight, but and they allow you to um, actually increase the, the velocity of which you deliver value for customers. We're about to start the one minute fire round. First question, what's your favorite book? So, of course, my favorite currently is this one. <laughs> so what's your favorite book? Favorite recent one is just Lo Loon Shots. I, I do like that by Safi Bacall wrote that. So that that's a good one. Who made the biggest impact in your career? I mean, I have Jeff Bezos ha, ha, has, uh, you know, I was, I was fortunate, very lucky, um, and to, to have been in that place in that period of time and spending those couple thousand hours with, with Jeff. So that was a great uh, opportunity that I was, um, humbled and, and, and honored to, to do. Who would you invite to your dinner party? You know, I'm more of an in introvert, but I, so I, I like, <laughs> I like family gatherings actually. So th those are the, my, you know, I've got big family, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I love family gatherings. Where can we find you outside of work? Probably running on the road. I try to run um, many, many times a week. Um, I get kind of cranky if I don't get out and uh, get some miles on. It's a good way to clear my head and also think about different issues. So if you see someone jogging that. <laughs> that's, that's you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Colin, for coming on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me, Grace. It was a great conversation.